Hello and welcome to Portage United Methodist Church online worship for April 5th, 2020, Palm Sunday. We're really glad you're here. And we hope you're managing to keep a smile on your face and hope in your heart during these difficult times. Today we're going to ask you to join us in a couple of hymns. Uh, the words will appear as a scroll on the bottom of the screen, and uh, when that happens, if you want to sing along, I think that would be pretty cool. you now from the gospel according to Luke, the 19th chapter. I'm beginning with the 37th verse. Now, as Jesus was approaching near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the multitude of disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles which they had seen. They were saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Now, some of the Pharisees in the multitude said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But Jesus answered, I tell you, if these become silent, the stones will cry out.
Well, if I don't praise him, the rocks are going to cry out, glory and honor, glory and honor, ain't got time to die. That's a section from a old spiritual, I think, a song that I learned, I think, when I was in high school. And, uh, and I, that's always what I think of when I hear those those words of Jesus. You know, if 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 these stop praising him, the the stones themselves will cry out. And I've always had that picture of sort of miraculous moment when stone song begins to reverberate from the ground because there are no human beings to praise God. And so I've I, I sort of I've always approached the, this text with the idea that. Um, that the praise is going to happen. The praise is going to happen. And so my choice is whether uh, I can be a part of it or not, but the praise is going to happen. And that's always been how I thought about this. Every once in a while, I run into an experience where someone will say something or I will read something that will completely change how I understand a story, a concept, or a text. It will just be like... And many times, I can't remember later where it came from. I just remember the thing itself. This is one of those moments. Uh, It was something I read about this passage, something about interpreting the stones will cry out very differently. And it startled and surprised me in such a way that when I read it, my first reaction was, oh, that's interesting. And then after that, I, I couldn't get it out of my head. And fortunately, that's what I remember, is what was said and not who. So my apologies to whoever said this first, because I actually think it was brilliant about the stones crying out. But let me back up before I, before I get there before I tell you what it is they suggested that we understand. I'm going to back up to just the history lesson. you got to understand what this world was like. It's about the year 10. Um, So Jesus at this time, in the the year 10, uh, is, you know, just an early teenager. He's about 13. And the Romans decide that what they're going to do is annex... Jerusalem into the greater territory of Syria. And so there's this thing that happens. There's a census. There's uh, the beginnings of a, a Jewish revolt. There's no king in Jerusalem again. And this is, this is the beginning of a feeling of occupation. I mean, the, the Jewish kingdom as such had always been under Roman rule, but suddenly it was under direct Roman authority in a way that felt like an occupation. And this begins a time of political unrest that's extreme. There, there's quite literally the development of a group that, that the Romans called the Sicarii. Uh, the Sicarii, Sicarii means slashers, because their preferred method of assassination was to slash with a knife. And, and they're they're referred to in the Bible as the zealots. The the zealots is the term zealotos. The the zealots, the ones who are, um, they have zeal. They're zealous for the kingdom. Um, we would use terms like Jewish nationalist or ultra Zionist or something like that to explain who these people were, and and they were violent. You could call them Al Qaeda or you could call them uh, ISIS or something like that. They're trying to, in fact, you might want to call them ISIS. They were not as well organized as the contemporary ISIS, but the idea was the same. They wanted to restore a Jewish kingdom. They were potentially violent and they were uh, they were a scary group of people and so the presence of the roman army both gave rise to them but also was increasingly necessary against them and the romans were pretty brutal in their put in their responses they were not smart about this at all there was no way to be smart i guess from their point of view it was just stop it and so we come to the reign of uh, of the prefect Pontius Pilate, who uh, his reign uh, is the best dating that dating is always tricky when you're talking about ancient times, but it, somewhere in the year 26 or 27 to somewhere in the year about, well, 10 years, so 36 or 37, somewhere in there. That's, that's his reign, 10 years that he was procurator or, uh, of, 
of this area. He he dwelt. He he resided in the city of Caesarea, uh, so he didn't actually live in in Jerusalem, uh, but he would come there whenever there was a, a big gathering. The, this would be the holidays. That's when people showed up. That's when things were really hot. If there was going to be a problem, that's when it was going to happen. And and Pilate had dealt with problems before. There had been. Uh, a group of people, these are the stories. Now, you have to understand the history is very poor for us. Um, you know, there's references to things, and, and it's impossible to be very precise about what happened. But here are a few of the things that we, we're pretty aware of. Um, there is a reference in the Gospel of Luke to 12 Galileans whom Pilate had killed and mingled with the blood of their sacrifice, which is probably a way of saying he killed them during the feast times, like during Passover or something like that. We know that Pilate had a reputation for um, disguising his, some of his troops uh, in civilian clothing. They would be armed underneath and they would slip into the crowd and then at a signal they would come out and they would use clubs. And, and there were a lot of deaths as a result um, the end of Pilate's career in Palestine began when there was a group of uh, Samaritans who had – so the story, there's a twofold version of the story, right? The official version of the story uh, was that they were armed and they had gathered together at the base of Mount Gerizim where uh, they were gathering in a sort of messianic rebellion against the Romans and so Pilate just had a bunch of them killed. The other argument from the other side was that Pilate was abusing his power. It was, you know, police brutality. These were unarmed people. What they were doing was, and if they had any weapons at all, it was merely for practical self-defense. They weren't. They weren't. A, they were archaeologists. Well, they had. They had had a vision that there was a, a religious relic left by Moses, and they had gone there to try to dig it up. And it was very, very important to them religiously, but th there was nothing, there was no rebellion, nothing against Rome there. And this was the last event ultimately led to Pilate um, leaving Palestine. And uh, as far as anyone can tell, he retired um, from public service at that point. He'd been, he'd been prefect f for 10 years. So, um, you know, he went, either went on to greener pastures or retired. But, but the point is that Pilate is not um, a particularly gentle guy in how he runs things. And you have that kind of intense military presence on the one side, and you have a very strong nationalistic, ultra-nationalistic, ultra-Zionist viewpoint on the other, and these are increasingly in conflict. And so when there is a big festival, everybody comes. 100,000 or more coming into Jerusalem for, uh, uh, for Passover. And during this time, it was very terrifying and very frightening, and it wouldn't be unlikely for riots to break out. And the problem is, if you're if you're rioting against if you're rioting against the Romans, how do you do that? You know, they're the ones with the army; they're the ones with the military weaponry. You would have some military weaponry, but not very much compared to them. How would you do it? How would you re rebel against them? What would that look like? And the answer is something we see in modern times. And here we come now back to this thing I had read. And when I read it, I was startled and I thought, oh my goodness. So think about modern history. Think about actually the relationship between uh, Palestine and modern Israel. Modern Israel was established uh, in 1948 by a decision of the newly formed um, United Nations. They carved out a chunk of land there, came a little bit from Jordan, a little bit from Egypt, but all of those countries were, you know, their borders were not well defined anyway because uh, they'd mostly been drawn by by the British, the colonial states sort of drawn lines. So there was this territory and all of a sudden there's all of these people are coming in from Europe into this territory. These people who are saying, uh, this is our land. God gave us this land, gave it to our ancestor Moses and gave it to Abraham, our ancestor Abraham, and, and this is ours. And there are people living there already going, well, I don't know what you're talking about. 
Now, some of those people continued to live where they had always lived and simply intermingled with the newcomers under a new government and didn't really care, but others left and, and felt displaced, and that created this sense of, um, of a kind of modern nationalistic view, the modern Palestinian nationalism. Uh, there wasn't really a nation or a country or a space called Palestine before. I mean, Palestine was a geographic reference, and suddenly it becomes a political reference. We want our land back. And and as this sort of happened, um, and once it got established that Israel wasn't going anywhere, what happens next? Israel, you know, you start seeing these occupations and spreading into what they call the occupied territory. So you have the development of a pushback from from the people who see them as occupiers. So in the modern world, the Palestinians play the role of the of the ancient Jews and the Sakari, and the modern Israelites play the role of the ancient Romans. I mean, that's it's the same political dynamic, even though it's a centuries later. And so what does the intifada look like? What does the resistance look like? It looks like people throwing stones. They throw stones. Big heavy rock hurled across at the police on the other side it can cause a lot of damage. The stones cry out. They don't miraculously get little mouths or they don't begin to sing a, a celestial or, I guess, territorial song. They fly through the air. The message of the stones is in their being thrown. Jesus is talking about rebellion. That's the suggestion. And when I read that, I said, oh my goodness, that's it. See, Jesus is coming down. It's a very tense time in Jerusalem. Really, really tense. Everyone's scared. Everyone's on edge. There are those who are the, the, the Zionists who are ready, looking for the revolt. There are those who are wondering if Jesus is the Messiah as he comes in during the, the entrance into Jerusalem. It's already a boisterous time. Anyway, they're singing songs. It's like a big parade. But Jesus comes in and there's a lot of people who are thinking maybe he's the messiah maybe he's that appointed king maybe the maybe the 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 revolt starts now maybe this is when it happens and his people are yelling and screaming blessed is the one who comes in the name of the lord and did you catch though um even even as even as the part about the stones is unique to Luke, so is this particular phrasing, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. This is really interesting because uh, the first part, blessed is the, the, the one who comes in the name of the Lord, uh, is from the psalm. And it is the psalm that was used as people entered Jerusalem at Passover, that was it was sung antiphonally as people were coming in. Blessed is the 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 one who comes in the name of the Lord. Um, here, it's blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. So they're already, you know, really interpreting this as a messianic challenge to Rome's authority. But then you have the words "peace in heaven and glory in the highest." And you know what's interesting about that is that for Luke, that's kind of an inversion of what the angels say to the shepherds when they say, uh, peace on earth, <laughs> right? So now it's peace in heaven. But the idea of peace is present here. And, it, and that's not what anyone's thinking. They're thinking war. And yet this line talks about peace. That gives us a clue. Because the Pharisees are rightfully worried that there's going to be a, a riot, that there's going to be violence, that there's going to be bloodshed, that, that the Romans are going to do what the Romans do and act out. And what Jesus, and what they tell Jesus to do then is tell your disciples to be quiet. Shh, we don't want to stir things up. And what does Jesus say? He says, if they become silent, the stones will speak. Isn't that interesting? Jesus is suggesting that the message that they're proclaiming, which is a message of his kingship, but a message of peace at the same time, not a message of revolt, is the antidote 
to the times that they're in. That that message of love and hope and redemption is the antidote. And that if that antidote is not administered, then what's left but the violence, but the stones to speak? I can't help but wonder. if Maybe we need to think about things the same way for us today. I I know everyone is afraid. Everyone is at home. I I read stuff about how people are worried that there's going to be increasing violence, that that there's going to start being, you know, I guess people begin to picture roving gangs of criminals breaking in to steal food from people who've got food in their houses. Uh, I happen to know that um, there was already a, a kind of a run on the gun shops with people buying firearms and, and ammunition, fear, expectation of violence. And so the stones maybe are getting ready to cry out. That's what we're afraid of. And maybe the antidote, not the antidote to the virus, we need the scientists for that, but the antidote to what can happen in our society is that message of peace and hope and love and grace and mercy and redemption that we proclaim as Christians, that message which begins for us here in Holy Week, our most sacred time. This is the message that we proclaim. Peace in heaven, peace on earth, love of God and love for one another. If we don't praise him, then maybe the rocks will cry out. And maybe you and I, maybe we are the antidote in a time when what is desperately needed is an antidote. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious God, we recognize that we live in scary times and that we are afraid. We are afraid of what might come. We are afraid of crime and violence and the possibility of riots. We're terrified of disease that we can't see, of people we can see. And so we live out of our fear. We hoard our food. We arm ourselves. And in the process, we create the very circumstances we're afraid of. But maybe we're the antidote. Maybe we're the solution, the ones to proclaim love and grace and mercy and redemption, to speak a different word against the word of fear, a word of hope, a word of grace, a word of mercy. Maybe we're the ones who keep, who prevent the stones from crying out. Lord Jesus, let us be the antidote for these times by your grace and your Holy Spirit at work within us. We ask it in your holy name. Amen. One of the things that we pastors always notice is that, um, you know, people miss what happens between Palm Sunday and Easter. You know, they, they, they come at the big Sundays, but maybe not so much in the in-between to get the full story. And so we like to remind folks of what's coming. And so I'm going to ask you to... Yeah, again, sing along. This is an incredible, beautiful hymn, a hymn which talks about what's coming, what Holy Week is all about, what it is that we as Christians proclaim, the faith which we have had from the beginning, that he died for our sins, and that he rose on the third day.
thank you for being with us today. I'd like to invite you to keep uh, supporting the church financially because uh, your support is everything. And even more importantly, support with prayer. Keep praying for the church. We don't know how the church will be affected by these changes and how we're living our lives today. And we believe that the church can survive. We believe in the future of our faith that, that there will always be a people of God speaking the message of grace. Um, but it doesn't change the fact that we you know, still have to pay the bills. So we'd love to have you support the church, which you can do either by sending a donation directly to us at uh, 1804 New Pinery Road, Portage, Wisconsin, 53901. Or you can use the phone number listed right here. That's so that you can directly text an offering. And that's pretty easy to do. The first time you do it, you do have to kind of in, you know set up the credit card thing. But after that, it becomes apparently quite automatic. And you can also sign up for electronic fund transfer, which means it just happens automatically. You can contact the church office at 608-742-2107. And that um, we will send you the materials necessary for that. We also want to invite you to to continue to support things like food pantries and 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 the kinds of work that will really help people who are in the fringes of our economy and are going to be really hurting in the next uh, couple of months because they're not getting the support, they're not able to work, and their bills are still coming in too. So I'm Pastor Tom from Portage United Methodist Church. Thank you for being here. And now may the Lord God bless you and keep you. May the face of the Almighty be upon you. And may God grant you peace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Peace. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you. Oh, may your countenance be lifted up. Oh, may God God keep you in right by your side. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you. Oh, may your countenance be lifted up. Oh, may God keep you in right by your side. Yes, may God keep you in right by your side. May God keep you in perfect, perfect peace.